On today's episode of You Asked, well, we're still in Las Vegas. So how about You Asked CES edition part two? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and I am staring directly into the sun. Deal is, either the background looks cool or I look cool. Can't have both at the same time, so pardon the squinting. Hashtag reporter life. At any rate, it has been one heck of a week down here at CES. And since we've been reporting on all the amazing stuff here at the show, we've received lots of great questions following up on our coverage. So we're gonna dive right into that right now. If you have a question that you'd like to see answered on You Asked, please email you asked at digitaltrends.com and I'll do my level best to get to it, but definitely after I get home from Las Vegas. All right, let's dive into the first question. Question one comes from Andrew who writes, what were your thoughts on the Hisense Canvas TV? Was hoping it might make an appearance in a video. And then Marcellus also said, any info about their Canvas TV? So yeah, I did see the Canvas TV and I did have interest in reporting on it. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see any of the Hisense stuff before the show floor opened. So once we got there, we had pretty limited time to cover everything Hisense was talking about. And the entire ULED series outside of the UX, so the U6 and the U7N and U8N was all hidden in a back room that we had limited time in. So my time was pretty well spoken for there and we just couldn't get to the canvas. Plus the canvas, which I think is supposed to take on the frame from Samsung, uh, is still very much in concept and prototype phase. I think that it's available in China, but whether or not it's going to be brought over into North America or spread out into other regions is as yet undetermined. Remember, a lot of CES is flexed by these brands, and so the canvas, I think, was a bit of flex. But I will say, just the cursory glances that I got, it looked pretty good. A question from VM Wear Dream says, is there any news or will you cover any news on the Roku TVs as well? So the news on the Roku TVs is that they have a new Pro series. This is meant to take on the TCLs and the Hisense and all the other manufacturers' top tier TVs. It's meant to be their best effort at picture quality yet. So if the Roku TVs that came out uh, last year were more uh, entry level everyman TVs, these are the ones that are supposed to appeal more to enthusiasts. And that's all the information that we have at this particular time. Uh, we did report on that at digitaltrends.com. I didn't get much of a chance to talk about it because we were busy with CES and they released that news during the holidays before we uh, flew out here. But I do expect to get review units in. We'll have a look at them and I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I do know that Roku has the chops for this. Uh, they're very involved in helping determine the picture quality of all the TVs in which their platform is used. Uh, so I think that their own TVs could stand out pretty well, but we won't know for sure until we get them in and we get to test them. All right, we got a question that came in from Brent. The subject is LG display, and the question is, why do you need them that bright? I think I can figure out what you were going for there. In fact, why do any of these TVs need to be that bright? Why are we talking about 4,000 nits, 5,000 nits, 10,000 nits? Well, the ultimate goal for HDR is to create the most realistic specular highlights, right? We don't want the entire TV to be that bright. We just want the highlights to be super bright. So the brighter a TV can get in very small areas, the more contrast, the more HDR pops. That's why we're excited to see these high nit numbers. No, you're not even gonna need all that brightness in a dark room, but if you're watching during the day and you want the best contrast possible, being able to punch a little bit higher when you're starting from a higher uh, low level, uh, your blacks aren't gonna look that black because it's a bright room. Having that extra punch in the specular highlights is gonna be great. Also remember, Dolby Vision's ultimate goal was to support displays that could hit up to 10,000 nits. And that's what we're seeing, a move toward that with Hisense talking about the only 10,000 nit display at the show. JR Fraser asks, will Hisense U8N be using only VA this year or will there be ADS Pro in at least one size? I don't know for sure, I will ask Hisense. I do know that almost all of the UX line is gonna be ADS Pro. I would imagine that anything above 85 inches for the U8N might also be the ADS Pro. Don't know for sure, again, but I think it's more tied to the size than it is to the actual series of the TV. I'm not sure I'm all that worried about it. ADS Pro works great when it's got a great mini LED backlight system with it. I will say though that the better viewing angles make it a, a better sell for me. But still, what we saw from the VA panels looked pretty great last year. At Canadian97 writes, honest question here, which I would expect nothing less from somebody whose username is Canadian97. 
Uh, can you really benefit from 10,000 nits when TV content is below such high levels? Isn't like buying an 8K TV when there is almost zero 8K TV content out there? No, it is not the same as 8K. Uh, resolution and HDR contrast capabilities are totally separate. Uh, it is true that you can upscale content to 8K, but the real benefit there is really to fill up all the pixels that you've got on the screen. When it comes to HDR content, even though the signal information isn't there for something specific as 4,000 nits or 5,000 nits, most stuff is currently mastered at 1,000 nits. We do see some 4,000 nit stuff, but I think we're gonna see more stuff at the 4,000 nit and above level. But even without metadata saying, go up to 10,000 nits, tone mapping allows these TVs to sort of, well, tone map across its entire capable range. And before, what they used to have to do was take high nit signals and kind of compress them down into their uh, usable range. Now, their capability extends beyond what the signal information is. So they're gonna have to do a different kind of tone mapping trick and basically map out the brightness across their entire brightness capable range. And I have some confidence that they're gonna do that pretty well if the processing is good enough. Hein Kadist writes, will there be any significant 10K nits content? I doubt it. Uh, well, I mean, I think any 10K nit content will be pretty significant. Will there be a significant amount of it? Not anytime soon. The TVs needed to get there first, right? So we've just gotten that. I think it's gonna take time. It's the whole chicken and the egg thing, right? Do you make the content first and then let the TVs catch up? Or do you make the TVs capable of doing this stuff and then let the content catch up? I'm all for the latter. Somebody whose screen name I cannot pronounce asked, do you think Samsung will ever have Dolby Vision in their OLED TVs? I do not. I think that Samsung is not interested in paying for the Dolby Vision licensing or incorporating the technology in their TVs. They like to believe that HDR10 Plus is just as good, if not better than Dolby Vision. And they will say they don't wanna pass the expense of having Dolby Vision onto their customers, even though there are lots of TVs out there that have Dolby Vision that are well less expensive than Samsung TVs. Uh, they're pretty well dug in. With that said, I also would have said several years ago that Samsung would never have an OLED TV because they fought that tooth and nail and look where we are today. So I could be wrong, pigs could fly, you never know. HyperSF2 asks, will the third gen QD OLED panel make it into the Sony A95M or is Sony done with OLED now? Sony's not done with OLED. Um, there have been some headlines put out there by people I respect because they're gonna get clicks uh, that suggest that Sony is ditching OLED. They are not ditching OLED. OLED TVs will be a thing for quite some time. Uh, they are not putting a lot of effort in coming out with a brand new model of TV when they don't see a specific benefit to that. Also, it took them a while to get the A95L put together, and I think that they're ready to take a little bit of a breather before they put out the next big thing. That A95L was very much a 2024 TV to begin with, I think. So they're gonna let that stretch out through this year, and then I think we'll hear about another model much later this year or maybe towards the beginning of next year. Will it be the A95M? I don't know, but what I do know is we see these companies skipping letters all the time for all kinds of reasons, lots of it having to do with uh, other brands' uh, IP around model numbers. So don't know that it will be called the A95M. I do imagine that the next version of a Sony QD OLED will have the latest gen panel in it though. I don't think they're gonna buy old stuff for a brand new TV. Another screen name I can't pronounce asked about LG's new transparent OLED. Can it be viewed from the backside or the rear side? As a matter of fact, it can. You can see it from both sides. What you'll see is a mirror image of the image that you see from the front side. So everything would be backward. That being the case, if you were trying to read words, they would look like backward words. Uh, but you know, anything like their fake fish tank, it just looked like the fish were swimming in the other direction. Barracuda Smile says, Panasonic linked up with Amazon Fire Stick. Is that gonna make any waves? I have not seen any coverage yet. Uh, so Panasonic has decided to build uh, some TVs with the Fire TV OS inside. Um, it's not like they just stuck a Fire Stick on it, just to be clear. Um, I think it's going to make a lot of waves. The Panasonic TV that they're putting it in is an absolutely top tier OLED that you know, attempts to challenge Sony's A95L. Uh, the fact that they went with Amazon Fire TV OS is good because up until this point, Panasonic has used its own smart TV interface and everybody I've spoken to says it sucks. So it's good that Panasonic has put 
a decent smart TV interface into its TVs. I think that TV is gonna be ridiculously popular with enthusiasts. Again, the biggest reason that I have not done a whole lot of reporting on it is because I've been reporting on TVs that are coming to North America. I will comment on that TV. It's just sad that I'll never get to actually have one in for review. Justin and Robin both asked questions about Samsung's Neo QLED uh, lineup. Was there any news from Samsung about Neo QLED? Haven't seen anything, just OLED and micro LED. Uh, and then another similar question, how good is the QLED lineup? So it looks great. The reason why there wasn't a ton of news around it was that Samsung didn't give us a bunch of news around those. Uh, I imagine that they'll be excellent. And I know that Samsung is very hype on its Neo QLED TVs, especially the 8K level, but they didn't talk a lot about new television specs. They talked a lot about new uh, experience features that will be coming to their entire line of TVs. So there wasn't a whole lot to dig our teeth into. When we're out here and we have limited time to do reporting, we tend to hone in on the stuff that's really new and really gonna grab a lot of people's attention. I'm sure they'll be fabulous TVs, but to the degree that they have been improved over last year, just don't know. Guys, it's cold out here and I'm blinded by the sun. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of You Asked. And in fact, for our entire CES coverage so far, it's been a real treat to have you in the comments section. If you enjoyed this particular video, do me a favor, smash it with a like. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell. I'll see you on the next video from Portland, Oregon. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like. Yeah, all right.